please tell us what your new book is about? Our new book, which I wrote with my longtime collaborators, Sidney Verba from Harvard and Henry Brady from Berkeley, is called The Unheavenly Chorus. And the subtitle, Unequal Political Voice and the Broken Promise of American Democracy, tells more about what it's about. The metaphor of the unheavenly chorus comes from a famous old quote in political science to the effect that uh, from a political scientist named E. E. Schatzschneider, who said quite famously, the flaw in the pluralist heaven is that the unheavenly chorus sings with an upper class accent. So political scientists will know what that means. Um, the book is about the way that in American democracy, in which the level playing of democracy promises that we will all be heard from equally and that public officials will respond to us equally. And that's what makes democracy different from markets. But what we know about American democracy is that um, people who, with, who are well-educated and affluent are much more likely to have their voices heard than people who are disadvantaged in terms of education and income. And this book looks at that subject from every point of view you could possibly imagine. So we look, for example, at individual participation and the many ways that, that Americans can take part in politics, not just by voting, but by protesting, or by working with their neighbors on a community issue, by getting involved in a campaign, working in a campaign, giving money to a campaign, getting involved in political organizations. Uh, there's just many, many ways that Americans can get involved in politics and make their voices heard. And so one of the things we do is we look at individuals. And in fact, we look over time. And what we found is that the unequal political voice on the basis of education and income is not something new. It goes up and down, but um, it's been with us for a very long time, in fact, since we've been measuring it, which is about 1950. Uh, we looked at unequal political voice on the basis of the organizations that represent us in politics. And we put together a database that included 36,000 organizations of organizations that have been active at some point in Washington politics and found that once again, um, the privileged are much more likely to be represented than those who are disadvantaged. We asked the question, um, whether social mo and political mobilization, as happened during the civil rights movement and the labor movement, can produce a situation where we overcome these inequalities of political voice. And there, it's, there's no question that it is true that social movements in the United States, some based on the disadvantaged, like the civil rights movement or the labor movement, and some mobilizing middle class publics all the way back to the abolition movement, the temperance movement, have made a difference in terms of policy. But we did something that no one had ever done before, and that's that we asked a random sample of people whether they had ever been asked to get involved politically, and if so, who would ask them? Was it someone they knew from their church? Was it someone they knew from work? Was it someone from a political party? Was it someone from an organization they belonged to, and so on? And what we found is that the people who ask others to get involved in politics are what we call rational prospectors. They look for people who are likely to take part in politics and to be effective when they do so. So that means that the ordinary processes of mobilization, not the special ones that have books written about them, uh, the, not the ones that get in the newspaper, but the ordinary processes by which we all ask one another to do things, yields uh, participation that is even more skewed in the direction of the well-educated and affluent than um, are the, uh, our ordinary processes by which people on their own initiative take part in politics. So in fact, these rational prospectors are finding people who are even more affluent and even better educated than we find in participation in general. So another question we asked was whether um, participation on the internet might help to overcome some of these biases. And we gathered the first data that anybody had about political participation on the, on the internet. And it turns out that while internet-based political participation helps to overcome somewhat the fact that the young are, uh, are less likely to make their voices heard in politics than our middle-aged people like me, uh, when it comes to the advantages that come from education and income, that's just completely replicated in internet participation. And it's not just a function of the fact that 
people with very low incomes and very little education are unlikely to be hooked into the internet, to have computers, to know how to use the internet and so forth. Even when we factor in just among internet users, it turns out that the same patterns of the overrepresentation of those with high levels of education and income persists in internet-based participation. So this book looks at every point of view that we could think of, and we kept finding the same thing over and over again. And to be honest, the, the one time when I gave a presentation about this book while it was still in draft at a university, um, someone who had read it in manuscript said, when this book comes out, you really got to read it, but it's very depressing. What are the main causes, history of the political inequality in the United States? The causes for these inequalities of political voice are very complicated. Um, at the individual level, the most important route is in inequalities of education. Education operates in many ways to be politically empowering. People who are well educated are in a position to understand politics, to find it easy to participate. It's much easier for someone like me who spends my life talking, writing, organizing things to get involved politically than people whose occupations give them fewer opportunities to exercise these civic skills. People who are well educated tend to have occupations that give them high levels of income. And income is increasingly important as a political resource, especially in an era where the courts have lifted the lid off inequalities of campaign finance. What we know about giving to campaigns is that the single biggest predictor of whether you're going to make a campaign donation is your level of income. And much more than that, the huge predictor of how big that donation will be is income. And so recent changes in campaign finance law that arise from court decisions have made the playing field even less level than before. Another thing about well-educated people is that they tend to be located in networks through which people will ask them to take part. And because they're well-educated, those rational prospectors we talked about a minute ago will target them with requests. Furthermore, well-educated people tend to have a strong sense of civic duty. That is their responsibility to take part in politics. They tend to know more about politics, to be more interested in politics, and to think that they can make a difference in politics. So education and the related uh, level of income are what's behind all of these inequalities. Now, in many democracies, some of these inequalities are ameliorated by the extent to which institutions mobilize more disadvantaged people into politics. And the two sets of institutions and democracies that do that particularly well are labor or social democratic parties and strong unions, neither of which we have in the United States. So it turns out that if we look across countries uh, that we would, might compare the United States to, these political inequalities of voice are more pronounced in the United States than they are elsewhere. What are the concrete steps that, in your mind, can improve this situation? With respect to the kinds of concrete steps that might be taken to level the playing field a bit more when it comes to political voice, one thing that we have to recognize immediately is the importance of our strong First Amendment. That is, the strong guarantees within the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights that guarantee freedom of speech and expression. And in this way, we have stronger guarantees than many other democracies. And so the last thing that we want to do is shut people up in order to guarantee that everyone is equally silent rather than that everyone exercises equal voice. The two areas of reform that have generally had the, the greatest focus are voting turnout and campaign finance. With respect to voting turnout, in many ways we have made it easier to vote. Uh, it's easier to register than it used to be. You can register at a, at a Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, you are supposed to be able to register at a public assistance office, but that part of what's commonly referred to as the Motor Voter Bill is less equally implemented. But in many ways, it's gotten easier to vote, and we have guaranteed an equal franchise. On the other hand, there are movements to make it more difficult to vote. State legislatures these days are concerned about the integrity of the ballot and have made it uh, that 
in many states you have to have a form of identification in order to vote. And how hard it is to have that piece of identification and what that piece of identification is and how hard it is to create, to uh, cast um, a provisional ballot vary within the, by, from state to state. Uh, another reform that other countries have is places like Australia and Italy, it's required that you vote. That seems like the kind of thing that is anathema to our individualistic and liberal political culture in America. Uh, so with respect to voting, which is the form of activity uh, in which the highest proportion of Americans engage and in which the closest to a random sample of voices are exercised, there are some things we could do. We could, for example, have our voting go over more than one day. Um, as in other countries, we could have voting on weekends so that it was uh, uh, easier for people to get to the polls. You know, these days, uh, it's, it's sometimes, these days, it's sometimes difficult when you get to the polls. I know that people in my own town, many of them spent more than an hour waiting in line to vote in 2012. And that makes it hard if you have to pick up a kid at daycare or you're late for work. And it's especially at those times, the beginning of the end of the day. So we could do things on a national basis to make it, uh, to have vote, more vo voting equipment. In my town, it seems there's just not enough. Or voting equipment that was easier to operate. Um, after all, voting equipment is mostly bought at the local level. This is something that is in many places under local control. And if the local budget is under pressure, which are you going to choose? Fire some cops? Fire some firefighters or some teachers so you can have new voting equipment? I think we'll all stand in line. When it comes to campaign finance, that is an arena in which um, the courts have pushed us in a direction by defining by defining making campaign donations as a form of freedom of expression, that's taken the lid off the ability to use market inequalities in politics. And as long as the courts are going in that direction, it's unlikely that we will see much that will overcome these uh, inequalities on the basis of education and income, at least when it comes to campaign finance. Your book is heavily based on data. What are some of the resources that you used in your research? It's absolutely remarkable the number of kinds of different resources we brought to this inquiry. Uh, there are introductory chapters that are based on, if you please, a systematic analysis of all the state constitutions, including state constitutions before the Civil War, showing what they the extent to which our states have guarantees of equality within their constitutions, and it's very interesting. It was something I never knew about. Most of our, or many of our states' constitutions begin with something that sounds a lot like the Declaration of Independence, talking about how all of us are created equal. But that was somewhat ancillary. In general, we have two kinds of data. The first are individual level survey data and we draw on a number of sources, including a survey that uh, my collaborators and I fielded a number of years ago. Unfortunately, it's getting old, but it is the single best survey having to do with political participation that's ever been conducted, and it has a lot of information in it. But as I say, we are concerned that it's getting old. So any kind of analysis we did, we relied on whatever survey we could find that had the most recent data. Uh, in addition to using data sources that exist, such as the American National Election Survey, which is done every two years out of the University of Michigan, the General Social Survey, which is done, I believe, every year out of the University of Chicago at NORC. We also worked with the Pew Center on Internet and Society. I'm not sure I've got that name right, but it is a Pew-funded institute that uh, is concerned with the effects of the internet on American politics and society. And we work with them to generate a survey that asked a lot of questions about in, uh, political participation both on the web and off the web and had parallel questions 
about, for example, getting in touch with a public official by making a phone call or writing a letter, as opposed to getting in touch with a public official by sending an email. So we were able to make comparisons between different kinds of participation on and off the web, and that survey was done in 2008 in conjunction with the Pew Center. And fortunately, even though the book's out, they were very pleased with what they got. They have collect, we have worked with them once again in 2012 and have collected the same kind of data for the 2012 election, and right now we're in the middle of, of analyzing those data. With respect to organizations, when we started this book, we said we weren't going to collect any new data. And our usual way of laughing at ourselves about this is that's a little like telling the customs official not to be interested in the plastic bag with the white powder in it. So we started when it came to political organizations active in Washington with a directory called the Washington Representatives Directory, which is published by an organization called Columbia Books. And every year they put out a directory of all the organizations that have tried to be active in Washington politics, mostly through lobbying, especially lobbying Congress, but through, through other forms of activity as well. And um, using that as a database, we coded all the organizations that have been active in 1981, 91, 2001, and 2006. And then added a great deal of data. For example, did they make PAC donations? Did they file amicus briefs with the Supreme Court? Um, did they testify in Congress? And in addition, we used the web and print sources to find out a lot about these organizations. When were they founded? What kind of people are members? Um, what is their purpose? And we categorized these organizations into no fewer than 96 different categories so that we could make very fine distinctions. Is this a corporation? Is this, as our university is involved in politics, Boston College, it's in the book. Is it a university? Is it a museum? Is it a hospital? Is it a group of nurses, the American Nursing Association? Is it a pro uh, professional association of lawyers? Is it um, a, a group that represents some kind of racial and ethnic group, whether it's um, Chinese Americans, or um, American Indians and so on. We looked at civil rights groups. We looked at organizations that advocate on behalf of the young. We had 96 different categories, and that was hugely data uh, time intensive. And in fact, most of that work, categorizing the organizations and coding the ancillary data about their activity, was undertaken by undergraduates that we worked with very closely and supervised closely. And in fact, in the, in the preface to the, to the book, when we, when we thank all the many people who helped us produce this long volume, there are the names of 27 Boston College undergraduates who helped with the research. And it was a huge pleasure working with them. I worked with undergraduate political science majors, all of them in our departmental honors program, and they were terrific. And training them to understand how to use various sources of information to code all this data was, was time intensive for us, but it was really important to get good information. And so in order to make sure that they were on deck, but also it became a collaborative enterprise. We met very regularly with whatever team of students was working with us, and we used to bring sandwiches in and have a lunch meeting and learn from them because they were finding out where the glitches were in actually implementing the procedures that we came up with. And so it was genuinely collaborative, and it's been a real pleasure for us that um, we've watched now a set of undergraduates move on. Uh, we. We have enough Phi Beta Kappas to, popu to populate our own Phi Beta Kappa chapter. We have law school graduates. We've created a lot of political science PhDs on this. And people have moved on with their lives in ways that are really impressive. And so we have what we consider a very large family that's worked on this project.